We're trusting in you, Jesus. We're relying upon you. Our hope is in you. Lord, this Sunday after Easter, as we look back 2,000 years, we realize that we can follow you through the death, the burial, and the resurrection, that we can repent, that we can be baptized in your name. That we rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice in your faithfulness. We rejoice in your loving kindness and your tender mercies. We trust you, Jesus. We are resting upon your promises. They are yes and amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, he is, he is to come. We look to you, Jesus. You are faithful, Lord. You are good. You are kind. You are true. Have your way. Lord Jesus, have your way in our homes. We cast our cares upon you. Would you join me right now? Let's cast all of our cares on the Lord. Every problem, every worry, every fear. Lord, we release everything to you. God, we admit our weakness. We admit that we are flawed and that we fall short. Lord, we confess with our mouth our need of you. God, we're not going to pretend we've got it all together. And if we think we've got it all together, that's the one that needs to be most careful. Lord God, because pride and arrogance are the greatest danger of all. Lord, it's so much better to see our fallen our weakness, our humanity. God, we look to you the divine, the perfect, the holy. And we trust in your love. Lord, your mercies are new every morning and your grace reaches for us today. Your kindness calls us. Your kindness calls me, oh God, to come to you and lay down all my burdens and my faults and I don't have to have any pretense with you. Most great people, you want to be great before them because you don't want them to know your weakness. You, you want to put on a facade, but you are so great and so mighty, yet you're so lowly and so humble. And you took upon yourself my sin, my iniquity, but I must confess to you. I must be honest with you. I must ask you for mercy. I must ask you for grace. I'm going to ask you for your kindness and your faithfulness. In your gentleness, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. I pray your anointing would fall on every home. That every heart that's truly hungry, that everyone that's prepared their hearts today, and God, if they haven't, that they would just be honest about it and say, Lord, I haven't, I haven't been doing right. God, I've been foolish. I, I've been distracted. But God, I want to draw. I want to draw close to you, Lord. In the last hours, Lord Jesus, we're asking that your Spirit do its work. Let your purpose and your kingdom come. Let your will be done, Lord Jesus, not my will. Lord, I reach today for the lost. I reach today for the broken. I reach today for those who once walked in truth. Those who once, whose robes were once pure and white, who once celebrated and danced before you, who once sang the songs of Zion, who once glorified you and magnified you and exalted you and extolled you with all that was in them, that gave you their very best. Lord, bless us and keep us. Shine upon us. Don't turn your face away. But turn your face toward us today. That we may see you. And that we may know you. We may be one with you. <laughs> As we gather together, Lord, let your will be done. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Jesus well, whether the church at home, to the church at home, we're glad that you're with us today. In just a few moments, we'll start. So make sure you 
take care of whatever business you need to take care of and come back ready. I hope that you're all dressed up for church or at least looking half decent. Try to stay awake and be strong in the Lord. Let the Spirit of God fill your presence because the presence in your home is dependent upon your prayer, your worship. So as we sing together today and worship Him today, lift up your voice, clap your hands. We encourage you, if you can, stand on your feet, get involved. Amen. I know that may seem like I'm pushing you a little bit. I don't mean to. I just want you to have an incredible move of God. And sacrifice brings the fire. So bring the sacrifice so God can bring the fire. God bless you. We'll talk to you in just a few moments. Uh, just. Praise the Lord. Well, we're the church in motion. So get moving around in your room where you are right now, wherever you're sitting. You might want to stand or clap your hands or lift your voice. We're going to cry out to God. So lift your voice with us together as we invite the presence of God into not only our homes, but into our hearts. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We magnify you. You are God and you are God alone. We've come to praise you. Our hearts are full. We feel the holy fire of your presence. We feel the anointing that has fallen upon us, Lord. A fresh fire, Lord, for a fresh day. Lord God, let it fall in my home. Let it fall in my heart. Lord, I'm crying out to you, Lord. It's my prayer that's going to bring the presence to this place. And God, I'm lifting my voice to you. I'm calling upon you. I've come to praise you. I've come to magnify you. I've come to lift up my voice and rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to praise you, Lord. I'm going to sing to the heavens ring. Lord God, I'm going to sing the song the angels cannot sing. I'm going to praise you with everything that's in me. I'm not going to give you my second best. Lord, I'm not going to give you my leftovers this week. You're going to get the very best that I have to offer. I'm going to give you my very best praise. I'm going to give you my best worship. And Lord, I'm going to take your word. I'm going to hide it in my heart. Lord God, so that I can please you and bring glory to you and bring honor to you. Hear us today, Lord. We've come to praise you. We've come to magnify you. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Clap your hands and rejoice. Holy, Hallelujah. Holy is the Lord. Worthy to be worshipped. Praised and adored. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Holy is his name. So let every nation and town proclaim the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Our God is higher than the highest and greater than the greatest. The name of Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. Jesus is worthy to be praised. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord. Worthy to be worshipped, praised and adored. Holy, 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 oh, holy is His name. Let every nation and town proclaim the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, for he's higher than the highest, and he's greater than the greatest, the name of Jesus, oh, the name of Jesus, Jesus is worthy to be praised, the name of Jesus, the name of 
Jesus. He's higher than the highest and greater than the greatest. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we we worship him and adore you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are making it all about you today, Lord. For you are so worthy of all praise and glory. Thank you, Lord. We serve an awesome God. And we lift him up today. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weak. Forever he will reign. He's awesome. My God is awesome. 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 He's awesome. My God is awesome. Savior of the whole world. Giver of salvation. By His stripes I am healed. God is awesome. Today I am forgiven. His grace is why I'm living. Praise His holy name. Oh, my God is awesome. He's awesome. Awesome. Yes, He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. And he's mighty. He's holy. He's righteous and great. He's awesome. Yes, he is. He's awesome. Oh, he's my deliverer. what he is. He's mighty and he's holy and he's righteous. He's great. He's awesome. Yes, he's awesome. He's my deliverer and my healer, provider, protector. He's awesome. He's awesome. Is awesome. He can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened forever. So 
soul so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkness night you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god oh close your eyes and sing it to him all my life you have faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God oh I love your In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. This is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yes, it is. Is running after, it's running after me. Hallelujah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. song of adoration. It's so easy for us, Lord, to get focused on ourselves. But the answer to my challenges, my needs, my situations is to see you. 
not to look in the mirror, but to look at you and see you and realize that mercy is available, grace is available, kindness reaches for me. And in that moment, I can release my iniquity. I can confess my faults. I can turn away. Why? Because I'm turning back to you. I'm looking to you, Jesus. You are the beginning, the author of my faith. And you are the finisher, the one that completes it. You are the omega. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I was out in the world this past week, and I had to go to the bank briefly. There's some stressed people in our world right now. And if you're one of those people, I want you to bring those needs to the Lord. also received a call last night from one of our parishioners. Jesse went, had to go to the emergency room. Um, some challenges, having difficulty breathing, and some fluid build up. So we'll pray for her today. We prayed with her last night. There may be others in your room right now. If you would, I'm asking you to reach out if there's someone there with you and take them by the hand or, or put your hand on their shoulder. We're going to bind together today for the needs. We're going to pray for those that have lost loved ones in the past several weeks. We know of people that have lost loved ones either to natural causes or maybe the coronavirus. But we're praying that God will be with them during this time, that God would strengthen them. And let's pray for those that are lost, for those that are, are finding a new normal in this situation, but it's not a good normal. And so let's pray that God would speak into their lives and draw them home, draw them back to Him. Heavenly Father, we come before You today. We stand upon the promises of Your Word. There, yes, and so be it. And God, we're claiming Your Word today that if two or three agree, touching any one thing that You're doing, so in every home, Lord, let there be a powerful presence of God. And in our hearts today, let there be a powerful move of your spirit that virtue might flow, that faith might reach out. Lord, it's not that we deserve it. It's not that we've earned it. It's because, God, the price you paid, Jesus, you laid down your life. The death, the burial, the resurrection of the risen one is the one that we're looking at today. We're looking at your power. We're looking at your glory. We're looking at your ability to deliver, your ability to set men free, your ability to heal. Lord God, we're looking to you, Jesus. You are the one that is able. Strengthen us, Lord. And maybe like the ones over the years, Lord, maybe even 2,000 years ago. Lord, I believe. Help all my unbelief. God, help us to reach out to you. And we know that in your mercy and in your grace, you will reach for us. And you will touch us with those nail-scarred hands. And oh, God, you will look upon us with those loving, kind eyes today. Turn your face toward us. And grant us the peace and serenity and faith to believe, to grab hold of the promises that we believe. Can we just worship him right now? Come on, let's look to Jesus. Let's not look around. Let's not look at our problems. Let's ignore ourselves and the people around us for just a minute and get in shut in with God in that secret place for just a moment. Heavenly Father, we seek you. We search for you. We long for you. We don't want to be the same as we were yesterday. We want to be, we don't want to go back, Lord, to ways that we once walked in. But Lord, we want to draw close to you, to a brand new and fresh way, to a fresh anointing, to a fresh flow of your spirit. Now move from vessel to vessel, from home to home. I pray, Lord, you would bind every hindering spirit, bind fear and doubt and uncertainty, bind complacency, bind anything that might hinder, Lord God, to the flow and move of your spirit. Because God, you are real, and you are faithful, and you are good. I speak from my own testimony, from my own experience. I am a witness of the resurrection. I am a witness that there is new life, and that there is hope in every circumstance, regardless of what my eye may see, and what my ears may hear, and what my heart may say. Your word is greater, and there is a witness of the Spirit. Lord, witness to us today. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you for being with us today. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for giving. Uh, if you have still, you haven't had a chance to turn in uh, tithes, offerings, but especially your um, your gift for our children's ministry, we would appreciate that. Um, we want to reach one million children this this year. The promise lives on. 
and so we encourage you if you have forgot or were not able to turn it in get it in so we can we can send that off uh, so that we can sponsor and support uh, those that are reaching out to our children around the world amen amen I would I would love the Holy Spirit to do a work among our children amen that only the church of tomorrow they're the church of today I really do believe that and we want the promise to be passed to another generation so if you want to leave a legacy invest in the kingdom amen god bless you we're going to sing another song before we go to the word would you this is your last chance to worship together and sing with us uh, so let's sing together amen god is elohim of all the holy prophets he's the el shaddai of all the seers and sages he's the mighty one of all the sacred pages he's the great He's the great I am, oh, He's the great I am, the everlasting Father, He's the Prince of Peace, the great eternal wonder, only Counselor, He's Zion's righteous Governor, He's the great, He's the great I am, oh, He's Jehovah God, the coming King of glory, He's the true the Lord of grace and favor, He is Jesus Christ, Redeemer, Friend, and Savior. He's the great, He's the great I am. Oh, He's the great I am. The everlasting Father, He's the Prince of Peace, the great eternal wonder, Holy Counselor, Zion's righteous Governor. He's a great I am. Oh, he's a strong rock by the healing one of heaven. He's the Holy Ghost, a spirit full of glory. He's the sacred one of all the gospel story. He's a great, he's a great I am. Yes, he's a great I am. Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace, the great eternal wonder, holy counselor, and Zion's righteous God. He's the great, he's the great I am. Oh, he's the great, he's the great I am. He's the great, he's the great I am. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make a joyful noise. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. We have come before His presence with singing, and He is our God. He is faithful. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I know that I'm a little proactive, but I do encourage you, if you have your Bibles, grab your Bible and turn with me. You can stand with me if you so desire. Begin to the Word of the Lord. Amen. It's interesting because when we get into the Word of the Lord, we often use this term. Breaking bread, amen. And that's the title of my message this morning. Breaking bread, amen. We're going to go back 2,000 years ago to the week after the resurrection. We're going to talk about two disciples. And we're just walking and talking when Jesus showed up, amen. The big idea today is that breaking bread together brings the aha moment or that moment of revelation when we break bread together. Does anybody want to receive a revelation of Jesus yes, Christ? Amen. Does anybody want to have fresh insight, yes. fresh joy, fresh strength, fresh vision and direction? Then you're in the right place today. You can know Jesus and you can know the power of the resurrection. Amen. You can know for a certainty in your own life that God is with us. Amen. Grab your Bibles. We're going to Luke 24, 35. Luke chapter 24, verse 35. Of course, this is Luke writing to Theophilus and he is um, telling him about the story of Jesus. And in Luke, we find this passage toward really the last big grouping here, the last story he tells before he talks about Jesus going up and being carried away in the clouds. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 35, it reads this way. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the making of in the breaking of bread, amen, in the breaking of bread. And so, of course, these two disciples ran back 
and told the story of what they had seen. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's pray together that God's word will go deep into our hearts. Heavenly Father, you see every situation. You see everybody under the sound of my voice. You know what's going on in their lives. God, as I share this principle of being the church while we're at home, of being the church while we can't come to the church, when we can't enter a building together, but we can still be unified in your spirit and your anointing can still flow. God, in each home, I pray, God, that you would flow, Lord Jesus. You're already there in every room. Now, God, speak into our hearts and speak into our minds. We are willing to hear your voice and to obey. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Let me start with a little story. When I came to New Brunswick, uh, what, five, almost five years ago now, it had been almost 30 years since I'd really been here for any length of time, and maybe more than that, really, uh, but 30 years. And so it was interesting when I went to my, I first started here, I came back to a camp meeting, and it was our, our first real uh, district um, event was camp meeting at um, uh, over here at CCC, Capital Community Church, and uh, we were having our our summer summit and as we went there of course i was meeting all kinds of people i hadn't met in 30 years and people would come up to me and say oh brother jeff brother tracy and they were saying all these kinds of things and i didn't know them from adam <laughs> i had no clue who they were um and of course you know a lot of people that are older than me could remember me when i left i was nine years of age as a missionary kid going to the foreign field i came back at 15 and went to Harvey Camp, but I had no real memory. I remembered a lot of names, but I didn't have faces to go with them. And every once in a while, I'd meet someone, and I kind of like look at him, and I kind of, I, I kind of think I know that person, but, but I, I, I wouldn't remember their name. I wouldn't uh, remember their, their background or anything like that, or the story that they had. And so it was kind of challenging because uh, you know I was meeting hundreds of people that knew me, but I didn't know them. And, and of course they announced my name to the conference, and we're so glad that he's here as a new minister in the district and all of this stuff. So everybody knew who I was but I oftentimes had no clue and uh, just to be transparent even if I had known their face doesn't mean I would remember their name because sometimes I don't remember my own name so <laughs> it's kind of a challenge sometimes uh, so when you when you face situations sometimes you're meeting a person um, and it's been a while uh, you don't sometimes recognize them especially if they've gone through a, a challenging circumstance I've seen people that turn gray within a year or two it's amazing, or maybe they went through great hardship or trial or some situation happened in their life. Um, and some people even uh, <clears throat> go the other way. They, may, they used to be gray, but now they seem to be, have darker hair. Um, they seem to be, <laughs> maybe they had a little surgery, I don't know. But whatever the case may be, they don't look like they used to be. Well, this story that I'm going to share with you today is actually about two people that should have known Jesus, uh, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who they were walking with. Um, and this is the a story that we're going to share with you today on the road to Emmaus, right after the resurrection. In fact, it was the same day as the resurrection. Um, of course, uh, two men were walking back on the road to Emmaus. Now, it probably would have been the afternoon because it was a probably about a two-hour walk. Uh, Emmaus is a village. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And so at two or three miles an hour, Let's say at three miles an hour, you're looking at maybe two and a half hours walk. And so as they walk, they talk together. Uh, and you can read this in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 14. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. They hadn't figured out what had really happened yet. And they were hearing about these kinds of things. And so the first point I want to make today, and I'm going to make five points. The first one is that these individuals were walking and talking. They were just walking and talking. In fact, uh, the last several weeks, because of the warmer weather, we've been enjoying walking and talking. Um, my family and I have gone uh, to the Covered Bridge Valley and done some walking back there, and, and uh, other people were out. Of course, we all kept our distance, but it was awesome, uh, and everybody was waving, and everybody was being kind, uh, so it was awesome that people were connecting one another and uh, caring for one another. Uh, and so we, were, we would walk, and we would talk, and uh, 
In fact, the other day, we went to the north side, just across the, the river from um, Northeast Christian College. And um, as we were headed north along the trail there on the other side of the river, uh, lots of people were there, children and parents. And everybody was keeping their space and keeping as far as they could on the trail from each other. But uh, it was a wonderful day, and people were talking and connecting and laughing and having a good time in the warmer weather. And so walking and talking together is a good thing. And I encourage people to do that as families. I encourage it for health issues, of course. Uh, it's a good idea. Uh, and so there's not much travel right now, but if you can, go out for a walk and talk and connect. And that's exactly what was happening here. The two disciples of Jesus were on the road to Emmaus. Uh, the word Emmaus actually means warm baths. And uh, there's uh, several other cities in the area that uh, mean warm baths, but on the day of the resurrection, Luke is very clear here. It's about 12 kilometers or seven and a half miles uh, to Emmaus. And so they were walking. In fact, Josephus also mentions a village called Emmaus about the same distance. So even though it no longer exists today in the place where it was, uh, it, was, it, was uh, it was a place that they were walking to. Now, what's interesting about this story is now Jesus was... Uh, revealed to uh, a group of ladies, uh, several Marys and, and other people, uh, met uh, J Jesus. And uh, in fact, they met angels also that told them that, that Jesus was, had left and uh, he was moving on. And so the tomb was empty. And in fact, Peter had run back. And in fact, later in this chapter, you'll see that they were sharing that with Jesus. They were talking about what happened. And so they were talking about the reports that they had heard as they walked back. They just heard about these great things. You have to realize what had happened. Uh, the one that they had believed in, these were disciples of Jesus. They, they had heard about his, his crucifixion or had been there. And they, they had heard about his judgment by the leaders. And they had heard that he was died, that he was buried. And then they heard these stories that he had risen again. And so they were talking about this. This was some very crazy stuff going on. It didn't matter where you were in Israel during the time of Jesus' death. The cloud, the, the, the uh, air was darkened and, and the earth began to shake and all these things happened. The, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. So there was a lot of big stuff going on during these uh, three days that had preceded the time that they were walking back. So they had a lot to talk about. And in fact, they were, uh, of course, the ladies had saw the tomb was empty. Peter had saw the tomb was empty. So they were discussing this, and they were discussing that. They had not witnessed this personally, but they had talked to people that were first-person witnesses that Jesus was no longer in the tomb. And so the next point that I want to make is not only were they walking and talking, but they were unknowing. As they, were, they didn't understand what was going on. And, they, and as, so Jesus, as they were walking and talking, shows up. Now the Bible is very clear here. You can read this in verse um, 15 of the same chapter, Luke 24. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. They, they couldn't see. They, they, they couldn't observe him. Uh, and so uh, they couldn't understand that it was Jesus they were talking to. Now, I don't know if it was just because they couldn't recognize him because he looked a little different or the Bible is very clear here. They didn't understand what was going on. They couldn't see what was going on. So as they were talking and reasoning with other and conversing with other as they walked along, all of a sudden a third person joined him and began talking to them and was listening at first. Just listened to them and Jesus drew near. And so I just want you to pay attention to what's happening here. In the first case, uh, all these things had gone on. They were just walking down. They were going about their business. They were, they were taking a walk back probably to a place that they were staying. Uh, probably one of, some, one of them, their homes was there in Emmaus. And so as they were walking back, a third person joins them, and Jesus drew near. Now, they didn't know it was Jesus. They just knew it was another man, and he drew near to them. The second thing that we see is that Jesus went with them. He didn't just come along and then leave them. He walked with them for the next probably two and a half hours or two hours or so. And so their eyes couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't perceive him, even though Jesus was right there with them, walking with them and talking with them and communing with them. They didn't know who he was. Now, I know you've probably heard this before, but it's amazing the number of times that we are not spiritually aware and we run into trouble. Some of you may be in that situation right now, or you look back over your life and you see times when we, we think that, that we're alone and, and we don't recognize that the one that's with us is Jesus. We, we, think that we think that God is far from us, and yet these two 
individuals who don't have any great names that we know of. In fact, as far as scripture is concerned, we don't know. Yeah, we only know one person's name. It comes out in the, in the text, but we don't know them. And so it's very interesting that Jesus picks these two people to walk with. Now, he's not in Jerusalem. He's not with the disciples right now. He is just walking with two disciples who one has no name that we know of. The other one is just someone that just has a name, but we don't know much about him. And Cleopas, we can talk about that in just a minute. We're going there next. But it's interesting that these were not like high level uh, people. They were just ordinary disciples, if you can say it that way. And they were just walking home. They were going to go sit down and eat supper and spend the night. And so they were just walking and talking. And Jesus drew near and Jesus went with them. And even though they didn't know he was there, he was there with them. So I just want you to know that even when you're walking and talking through life, Jesus is there with you, even if you don't know it. And that's very clear from this point. But Jesus, the, the next thing that I want to mention here, the third point I want to make, is that Jesus asks questions. Now, he joins them, and he opens the discussion. He connects with them as they're talking and reasoning and conversing. He begins opening the discussion and connecting with them by asking questions. And I just want to let you know today, if you want to connect with people, that's a great way to go. Ask questions. In verse uh, 17 of Luke 24, it says this, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, you, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened these days? And he said to them, what things? Jesus responded by saying, what things? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, it's very interesting, the identity of Jesus in the minds of his disciples. But I want to just kind of walk you through this and pick out a few points here. Number one. Is Jesus asked them questions to open the discussion. And he asked questions so that he could connect to them and understand what was going on. Because what he noticed about them was, is that they were sad. They were sad. They were sorrowful. Now, that's, this is very interesting because they've already heard testimonies. And we'll talk about that in a minute also. But they'd already heard testimonies from Peter and from, from the ladies that the tomb was empty. And yet they are looking to Jesus and, 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 and talking with him. And they don't know who he is. They don't realize who he is. But Jesus notices they're having trouble. They're uncomfortable. When they should be rejoicing because the Savior has risen, they don't have faith. They don't have an understanding of what's going on. And so Jesus notices that they're sad. And because Jesus asks questions, now listen to this. This is really interesting. Because Jesus asks questions, they assume he has some kind of problem. They get kind of an attitude with them. Notice their response. Are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on? Where have you been? <laughs> Where have you been? Have you ever had somebody respond to you that way? Like you have, you know, this big news going on and you don't know what's going on. Or maybe you do and you, you just want to talk to people and they, they act like you have no, do you have no clue? What's wrong with you? Have you lost your ability to understand things? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on? Where have you been? Don't you know? They, so the other question that they ask Jesus is, haven't you been paying attention? Don't you know what's been happening? You don't know what's going on. Are you the only one? And don't you know what's going on? Don't you pay attention? I mean, you've been in Jerusalem. We, we know you are. You're walking with us. You came from Jerusalem. Where have you been? Don't you understand what's going on? And don't you know what's going on? Don't you, un don't you know? Don't you understand what the situation is? And their response is to his question, what things? He says, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, I'm not going to critique them, but it is interesting that their, con their revelation of Jesus is, number one, he's from Nazareth, which was not the good part of the town or the good part of the province. Um, it was it was a bad place. It wasn't really known for its uh, people that were great. But yet they understood his disciples that he was from Nazareth. He was fulfilling of a prophecy. And they also said he was a prophet. Now, they didn't say he was the son of God. They didn't say any other number of things that they could have said to them at this point in their understanding of Jesus. 
they are seeing him as a mighty prophet who had did great works before God and before all the people. In other words, everybody saw that this Jesus of Nazareth was a mighty prophet. Now that's their highest revelation. That's their highest understanding of Jesus. So they're walking with the very God of heaven, robed in flesh. He's standing there with them, the one that they have followed for many, many years, probably since maybe even John the Baptist when he baptized him in the Jordan River. And, and then they're walking with Jesus and they don't know him. And they're accusing him, they're accusing Jesus of not knowing, of not paying attention, and of not being aware. Now, do you find any irony in this situation with me today? Have you ever been in that situation with the Lord where you thought He wasn't with you? Where you thought He didn't know what was going on? Where He didn't, you didn't think He was paying attention? That He didn't know and understand your challenges and difficulties and situations? And He's asking questions like, ah, uh, What's going on? Why are you talking this way? And, and what things are going on? And, 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 and so this is what they're facing right now. They're, they have questions. Jesus has questions and they have questions. I think in our time right now, a lot of people have questions. Maybe you're one of those people, you've got some questions in your mind. Where's my money come from? What's the future for our culture? What's going to happen to our culture after this time of, of seclusion? After this time of social distancing? What's going to happen? I don't know. I really don't know. And, and so we've got questions after all these happenings. What's going to happen to us? What's the challenge? And what are the situations? How are we going to, is my job still going to be there? All these things that we could be focused on and worry about. Because they were focused on the impact of the situation. They were focused on Jesus as a prophet. As one who spoke the word of God, but really had no power. That was perhaps still in the grave from their perspective. And so Jesus, who is walking with them, Hears them say of him, you're just a prophet. You are, he was mighty, who was a prophet. Do you understand what we're saying here? They're speaking of him in the past tense. I don't know. We have to be careful. I believe we live in a culture that's acting like God is dead. Like he's not alive. Like he's not aware that he hasn't been resurrected. I believe we're living in a world today that's acting like Jesus doesn't even exist. Like, like there was never, uh, that, that he does not live forever and forever on the throne of heaven. That he doesn't have the power to heal. That he doesn't have the power to restore. And I'm here to tell you today that just like, let's like these these men that were walking on the road to Maze, just two disciples, basically people with no name, like Cleopas and, and of course the other gentleman that was with him. We don't even know his name. And so we, we, we can identify with this, at least I can, that I have questions, I have concerns, I have situations. But the interesting thing is Jesus is also asking questions. I wonder if what God is asking of you today. What questions is God asking of you today? Number one, you might ask him, he might be asking you, where are you? Do, who do you say I am? What do you think about me? Uh, well, Jesus, I believe, is asking us questions. Uh, what's going on in your life? And it's interesting that Jesus wants us to tell him what he already knows. The truth is Jesus knows everything that he asked them about. Jesus asked the question not because he didn't know. Jesus asked the question to begin the discussion and to understand where they were coming from and to understand their assessment and their uh, viewpoint of what was going on and what had happened. Jesus was checking in with his disciples. Jesus was stopping by their, their walk and talk to see what, what was going on in their lives. And, and as he talked to the everyday disciple, these were not the apostles, he was talking to the everyday disciples that had been followers of Jesus. What he under, ha, found out was that they were very disturbed, that they didn't understand what was going on, that they thought he was the one that didn't understand, and that th finally, that they didn't, they only called him a prophet now. He was a prophet. He's in the past tense he's dead he's no longer with us and we're not sure about about Jesus we're not sure who he is and who he was he was a great prophet we know he did mighty acts we know he did great deeds but we don't really know who Jesus is and so what is your response today when the Holy Spirit comes knocking on your door like he's doing right now and when he starts asking questions and you start accusing him of not paying attention to your problems you start if you're not careful you start saying that you're just a prophet you're just someone that speaks the word and you have good things to say and and you have good things to speak into my life but my question is today do you really hear him you see our world today says I don't hear him asking questions 
I don't feel like Jesus is near to me. I don't think Jesus is walking with me. Jesus doesn't really know what's going on in my life. Jesus doesn't know my challenges. But I'm here to tell you today that the Bible is very clear that even if you don't think you hear God, you're hearing from Him. Let me just mention several things Scripture mentions. I'm not going to do a great exposition on this, but number one, your conscience is a sign that God speaks to you. Your conscience, when you feel like something's wrong or you, you feel pressure not to do something or, or to do something, your conscience is the voice of God. Number two, the people around you. A lot of times the people around you will say, hey, I'm a little concerned about you or what's going on in this situation. God uses people. God loves to use people. He likes to use the human touch for the human race. He uses human people to check to see if we're proud because if we're humble, then we'll listen to the people around us. He uses pastors and leaders and, and even bosses. He uses nature outside. Right now we see nature being reborn. That's a sign. That's what we can see God in nature. At least that's what uh, Paul spoke about and so we see him in the heavens we see him in the greatness of our world and so we also hear sometimes as we go to bed at night or wake up early in the morning or in a time of quietness we hear a still small voice that's also God speaking to us when you open the word of God and you begin to read the Bible you'll have questions you hear the voice of God uh, kind of prompting you and talking to you and when you get in time of prayer and you begin to speak to the Lord and you pray, you'll begin to feel and you'll get impressions. And sometimes even it, sometimes people have had audible voices, but most of the time you get impressions or, or a sense that God is pushing you in a certain direction. God talks to us in many ways. But I want to be very clear with you today. God prefers to talk to you face to face, head to head and tat to tat. That's, that's the concept. He wants to be right near you. He wants your mind and his mind to be right next to one another. He wants to talk to you face to face. And so Jesus, he's leaving the apostles. He's leaving. There's thousands of people that he could have been with that day. But instead, he spends two and a half hours or so walking with an undamed disciple in Cleopas. And he's, he goes on, and this is, and let's find out what his reason is. The fourth point that I want to make to you here today is that Jesus exposes the reality. Jesus was walking and talking with them, it's true. It's true, we've, we've talked about the other points. Jesus was, they were walking and talking, and they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't recognize him. And, and the third point is we have questions, and God has questions of us. But the next thing that Jesus does, and he does this in every life, and I, this is why I find this so poignant and so interesting for us, is after we've felt the resurrection, after we've, we, 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 Jesus has risen, it doesn't mean that we understand. It doesn't mean that we've received a personal revelation. Just because it's true doesn't mean that God has spoken into our lives. It doesn't mean that we have dealt with a reality in our life. And in Luke 24, verse 25 through 27, Jesus says to him, O oh, foolish ones. Now, wow. What a great thing to say to some people who don't know you who you are. To them, he was a stranger walking with them to Emmaus. And they just share with him all their concerns. They share with him their doubts. They share with him their impressions of Jesus, that he's just a prophet, and that maybe he's still dead. And so, and they've been talking about all the things they've heard and the eyewitness testimonies that happened that very morning from Mary and, and all the others that had saw uh, Jesus and then Peter who had gone to the tomb and it was empty and he goes he goes and he says this in Luke 24 25 oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken see Jesus zooms in on where they were talking about they could honor prophets but they were dishonoring the prophets by not recognizing who Jesus was Slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And at the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now this is interesting. And um, most of us may be challenged by this. Last week I talked about us being lame. This week, I'm talking about us being foolish. And you say, well, pastor, you're really being mean. No, uh, this is what Jesus did. When we lack faith, when we are slow to believe, when we do foolish things and we don't understand 
and we don't comprehend and when we're slow to believe it, lacking in faith, Jesus calls us foolish. Jesus calls us faithless. And Jesus called them slow of heart. They're slow to believe. They lacked in faith. And Jesus goes on to remind them what the prophet said, what the word said. Not what they feel, not what they think, not what they're hearing from culture, not what they've been hearing from everybody in Jerusalem, not the running away of the apostles, not all these things that happened. He's reminding them of what the scripture says. See, they called him a prophet. So Jesus begins there. And he said, well, do you believe the prophets? And he goes on to talk about this. And he asks them one more question. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? Number one, he says that they're foolish. Number two, he says they're lacking in faith. And then he begins to, he asks them the question. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Now, this question is very interesting, I think, because what he's asking them is a question that we often struggle with. See, the problem was, is that he could only have been a prophet because all the prophets have suffered. All the prophets were killed. All the prophets were persecuted by the Israelites, by the Jewish uh, nation. And so it was no difficulty for them to grasp that prophets were persecuted, that the people of God were put down, that that. People would do their own thing for their own power, for their own glory, for their own goodness. So they had no problem grasping that. That was part of the narrative. That was part of their tradition. What they had trouble with was that there was something new. That there was something amazing that had happened. They were struggling to believe that what all the prophets had suffered for, that all the words that had been spoken had come true that very day. All the prophets, everything since creation had pointed to this moment when Jesus would rise and that there were witnesses of the resurrection but they were struggling with it because it was a new concept it was a new idea I'm here to tell you today that Jesus wants us to transition to another level of understanding another level of awareness I believe myself included that we are foolish people that we are people that are slow to be to believe slow to have faith slow to understand what God wants to do in our lives God wants to raise up a generation of people who are bold who are powerful who are mighty the church that's in motion the church that's taking the world by storm but if we're not careful we'll just roll over and hit the snooze button and fall back asleep but this is a wake up call this hour for the church is a time to wake up and realize that we no longer need to be foolish that we no longer need to be faithless but we need to be full of faith full of understanding full of the word of God we need to apply what we know and so Jesus expounded he explained and he exposed the big picture to see the problem was is they were focusing on themselves so I got a question to you today from the Holy Spirit are you focusing on yourself during this coronavirus time is it about you or is it about Jesus is it about our world is it about the lost? Because I, I, I'm being honest with you. We are, if we're not careful, we'll have a new normal. And our new normal will be. I was talking to someone this morning. And we were talking about it. And I said, it's, you know, this is our fifth week. And that was, it was almost like a revelation. That this is our fifth Sunday online. See, we, we already started adjusting to a new normal. To being at home and and all the and not going to church and all these different things we have to be very careful because when you start to adjust to a new normal that can really hinder you from seeing the big picture because we're starting to become isolated if we're not careful and we have to be very cautious that we don't become foolish and faithless we have to be very careful because god will expose the truth about us if you allow him and i don't know about you i want the truth about me exposed Maybe you're sitting there on your comfy couch. I don't know. And maybe you don't want the truth about you exposed. But the reality is for me. I want God to come alongside me. I want God to draw near to me. I want God to commune with me. I want God to have a head-to-head, tete-to-tete conversation with me. I want God to get close to me. And if He calls me foolish, then I am foolish. And if He calls me faithless, I am faithless. But oh God, show me Your glory. Show me Your Word. Help me expand my vision. Help me not to fall 
fall into the trap of a new normal. But oh God, draw me to a greater vision and greater insight. Oh God, take me to realms I've never been before. Places in prayer that I've never experienced. Understandings in the word I've never known before. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your energy? I know some of us working. And I know some of us are, are struggling and hurting in different ways. But I'm asking you, look beyond yourself. Look beyond your family. Look beyond the challenges that you're facing. And look to Jesus. Oh, listen to the voice of God today. He's asking some questions. Would you come close? Would you draw near? Would you draw near to me today? Oh, would you just take a minute to praise Him? Thank you, Lord. You're so patient with us. Our, our understanding is so finite, but yours is infinite. God, you're patient and willing to explain. You're willing to unpack our understanding. You're willing to expound. When we look at Jesus in this situation, they're thinking of him as a prophet, someone distant who shares the word. But the reality was, is Jesus right there with them. Even though they didn't know it, he was acting like a friend. He was treating them like a good father or a parent. He was being so understanding. They were acting foolish. And they were faithless. And they were afraid. And they were worried. And they were concerned. But that's because they were looking at themselves. And this, their understanding of the situation. Rather than understanding the word of God. Had already declared it. I want you to know that this last days that we're in. Is already in the word. We don't need to be caught off guard. We don't need to be wondering what's going on. We don't need to be foolish. And we don't need to be faithless. These things have been promised in the word of God. That in the last days perilous times would come. I could go on and on. We'll talk more about it probably next week but I just want you to know God knows where we are and God is not far from you he's, draw, he's drawing near to every one of us he's as close as, as you can possibly be without you knowing it and he's right there with you and he will under, give you understanding he will reveal to you his word and that's my final point today is that they finally had a revelation of Jesus Luke chapter 24, verse 28 through 31. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And Jesus, he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Now this is just a crazy, amazing thing that happens here. Jesus has been walking with them for probably more than two hours. They've walked in there. He was going to pass them by. I need you to understand Jesus would have kept going if they had not constrained him if they had not said no no you got to come with us and they asked him would you abide with us would you stay with us it's toward evening and and we want to feed you we want to be hospitable and, and jesus was willing to stay with them it's really kind of amazing he was willing to stay with them i mean this is he's only going to be on earth for maybe 30 or 40 more days before he's going to go into the clouds Probably 30, 35 days, somewhere in there, maybe 40 days maximum. And so, so and he's, he's willing to sit down and eat with his disciples, one with no name in Cleopas. And so he's sitting down to eat with them. He's willing to stay and eat with them. And so he sat down with them. And they began to eat. And they gave him the bread. And he took the bread. And he blessed it. And he broke it. Now, I want you to realize what happened. They haven't recognized him for hours. Yet when they sit down to eat with him and he takes the bread and he blesses it and then he breaks it. Their eyes were open. They knew him at that moment. Now you could say lots of things. There's lots of reasons why that could be the case. Why it happened right then. But I, I think that somewhere in their spiritual being 
there was something that happened there. I think these were people that were there when the 5,000 men were fed. I believe that they were there when the 4,000 were fed plus women and children. Something clicked. Something came into focus when they sat face to face with Jesus. All along the way, they've been walking beside him. You know, they're turning their head once in a while, but they're, they're all facing the same direction. But when they sat down and were still, and we're face to face with Jesus. And Jesus took the bread. He took the word. He took the understanding. He took what I'm doing. The preaching this morning. He's, he's right there with you. I believe Jesus is right there in your living room right now. And the bread has come out. But, but you don't have a revelation of Jesus yet. But right now I'm here to tell you that Jesus will take the, the word of God that has been preached. The word that he has given you. And the prophet is spoken. But the, the Holy One is about to show up. The King of glory. The Son of God. The Redeemer is in the house. He's more than a prophet. More than a prophet is in your room. It's the living God. And He loves you. He's a wonderful friend. He's a faithful father. And He's sitting there with you right there in your living room. You're face to face with me. But I tell you, more important, you're face to face with God. And God takes the word that's been presented here today. And if you'll give Him the bread, if you'll give Him the essence of your life, if you'll give Him what's valuable in your life, and He, he will take it and he will, he will bless it. He will bless what you give him. You say, well, I don't know. All I've got is a little bread. Oh, I've heard that. There's story after story after story in Scripture of someone who just had a little meal, just a little bread, just a little bit of this, just a little bit, of, just a little a crumb of faith that falls on the mouth. Oh, I just need a little bit. But hey, I tell you what, you bring that little bit to Jesus and you'll receive a fresh revelation and God will take it and He will break it. He will bless it and then He will break it. Yeah, it won't look the same when He gets done with it. It'll look different but it'll be available it'll be ready it'll be uh, able to feed others beside yourself and they recognized in that moment that Jesus was with them the truth is some of you are sitting there right now maybe listening to me and you don't know if Jesus is with you well I'm here to tell you he's been with you all week long I hope you're not ashamed of some of the things you've done because God has been with you all week long he's drawing near to you as you've walked as you've counseled as you've discussed your financial challenges as you discuss the situation in the world as you talk about the problems and the fears and the concerns I'm here to tell you today that God may call you foolish and he may call you faithless but he also will never leave you nor forsake you He'll, if you will ask Ask Him today. And you must ask Him. Otherwise, He'll keep going. I'm asking you to write in your room or wherever you are today that you would constrain Him. That you would say, God, I'm not going to let you go. Jesus, you can't keep going. i got to keep you here with me. I, I don't know everything about you. Maybe you're a stranger. Maybe Jesus is a stranger to you. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you today, constrain the Lord. Say, God, come be with me. Come be in my presence. And we'll, we'll eat together. We'll sup together. We'll, we'll break bread together together and God will reveal great revelation and that's when they recognized him oh I gotta ask you some questions in conclusion here today when it's time to move on some of you may be feeling that way right now. You're thinking about lunch. I don't know. You're thinking about something else. Maybe you're in his service or you're in your home. And because you're hungry or you want a distraction, or you're tired. And you, you know, maybe it's just a form of godliness. I don't know. But how do you treat Jesus when it's time to eat? How do you treat Jesus when it's time to move on? How do you treat Jesus? Will you constrain the Lord today? Will you invite him in to your home and to your heart? They didn't know it was Jesus. I just need to share something with you. You'll never know it's Jesus until you start being hospitable, until you start loving people, until you start caring for people. They didn't know it was Jesus. They just knew that they'd walk with him for two and a half hours and he was going to go on into the evening with nowhere to go, nothing to eat. They didn't know who he was. But they were hospitable. They were loving, caring people. And because they reached out, Jesus joined them. Amen. Do you know how many times in Scripture the Bible says this? That we need to entertain strangers. Why? Because some people have entertained angels unaware. They were entertaining the God in flesh right there in their home. 
It was probably a simple house. It's a small village known for its warm baths. <laughs> and yet they're there. And Jesus is in their house and they don't even know it. They didn't know it until they broke bread with him. We can miss opportunities if we don't ask strangers to say. We often use the word neighbor. Jesus says, love your neighbor yourself. The word neighbor just means whoever's close. Say, Brother Jeff, I can't have my neighbor over. For many of you, your neighbor's already in the house. It's your spouse. It's your children. It's your parents. That's who your neighbor is. Whoever's close. And if you can't love those that are close to you, your friends, or whoever's near you, if you can't love those people, then you don't love Jesus. Because Jesus said it so often, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it as unto me. Only by loving him and sitting at the table with him and breaking bread with him did they come to know Jesus. And the only way you're going to know the people in your home, the only way you're going to know the people around you is to walk with them and talk with them. But above all, sit down to supper with them. I want to do a little application here. It won't be much longer. But there's no good in me just preaching a message if we don't break it. So allow me to break it down for you for just a moment. What road are you on? Emmaus was nowhere. A place with a warm bath. A place where you get cleaned up and feel a little better. Who are you traveling with on this road of life? While we're at the church of home, don't lose sight of who Jesus truly is. Jesus will draw near to you. Jesus will walk with you. So in your home, I'm going to get very, very direct. Feel this from the Holy, from the Lord today. Are you walking and talking with your family? Are you spending time doing things together? Talking while you're doing the things? Talk about things that are more important, bigger than yourselves. Don't be arguing, causing strife. Talk about something more important than yourself. Otherwise, you'll end up fighting. Number two, do you know each other? Do you truly know your family? I'm sitting here today, and I'm looking at Andrew and Brooke. I know they spend time together. But Brooke is changing all the time. And I bet you there's things about your dad you don't know yet. But we get casual. We get comfortable with one another, and we assume we know what's really in the heart of others. We don't. It's because we're foolish people. We have to, we don't really know each other. We, don't, we can't stop. We need to stop assuming we know the people around us. I don't care if you've been married for 50, 60, 70 years. There's still things to learn about that person that you live with. So how do you do that? You ask questions. That's what Jesus did. That's what the disciples did. Find out what they're interested in. Jesus asked questions to things he already knew the answer to. Why? Because Jesus is an example. You may think you already know the answer, but ask questions. Kindly, nicely, lovingly. And don't be offended when they assume that you should know it already. <laughs> I've had it happen this past week. But you should already know that. Dad, you should already know that. Jeff, The truth is, sometimes we don't know, but sometimes we do. But we need to open communication. And questions is a great way. So don't be offended when people assume you should already know what you're saying. Don't be small. Don't be petty-minded. Think kindly. Be loving. Be merciful. Allow yourself to be exposed. Allow yourself to be open. Allow yourself to be honest with one another. I know our world can use the word exposed in a very negative way. But we need to be transparent and honest with one another. We need to get to the heart of the matter. There may be issues in your marriage. There may be issues in your relationship with your family members that have been going on for years. And nobody wants to talk about it. Why not today? Why not today? Why not today? 
insist on it. And finally, after being exposed and being open, being real and honest and transparent, insist on caring for others. Don't let people continue on without connecting to them, without sitting down to eat. Now I'm going to be very, very direct here. If you're not eating supper together at least three or four times a week while you're doing this coronavirus, you need to fix that. I'm going to be very, that's very practical, isn't it? If you don't sit down at the table, I'm not saying go sit in the living room and watch something or listen to the radio or something. I'm talking about turn everything else off unless you get some good music playing in the background and sit down at a table and break bread with the people around you. You see, some of you have been looking for Jesus in a lot of different places and you can't find him. I'll tell you where you'll find him. You'll find him when people come together to commune with one another. When Koinonia shows up, when two or three are gathered together and you pray the blessing over your meal and you begin to break bread with one another, begin to eat with one another. It's so practical, I know. I preached a message similar to this many years ago when we were talking about building faith at home in St. Louis. And it, it was amazing. People that actually listened to me and did it, it transformed their family. Because what happens is when you sit down face to face and break bread, that's when you truly get to know one another. But amazingly enough, beyond that, that's when you get to know Jesus. Because Jesus is in your heart of your neighbor. Jesus can be reflected through the people around you who are the body of Christ. Start sharing. You say, I don't know what to talk about. We'll share the good and the bad. Let's talk about thorns and roses is what we talk about. We talk, we share. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Heavenly Father. You want to bless us with great personal revelations during this time. You want to transition us to another level. You've been walking with us. But do we know that you're with us? Do we recognize you? Are you just a prophet? Just someone who spoke life into our world or brought healing or did some great miracles? Or are you our Savior, our friend, our Father. Jesus, you want to renew the relationships in our families. You want to remove the gunk and the nastiness that's been there for years, the unforgiveness, the lack of mercy. You want to give us a fresh vision for ourselves, for our own future. Let us not find the new normal. God, we need to find the supernatural for our families. Lord, something has to change. Let us not forget the wake-up call we got a month ago. God, we got that out That there's something wrong in our world. That this world is groaning under the sin of man. God, awaken us. Lord, give us a fresh vision for our family, our community, our city, our world. Lord, the first church was known, Lord, for breaking bread from the house to house. Lord God, help us to break bread in our homes. Maybe it's with a friend. Maybe it's with a, maybe we call someone, Lord. I'm encouraging people to call one another. Why not get your phone out? Get your iPad out. Skype or Facebook a family member and sit and eat with them. Schedule it. Insist on it, Lord. We can't let you keep going. We've got to stay with us. And where there's harmony, where there's unity, where there's forgiveness, Jesus shows up. Where there is love. As we sing a song together, would you turn around? Would you make your place, your house an altar? Come on, could we be, become a place of sacrifice? Let's not run from the suffering and pain. Let's realize it's part of the process. Let's not withhold our faith. Let's not be foolish enough to believe that there's no pain in serving God and walking with God and being human. It's part of it. Jesus had to suffer, and so will we if we follow him. Let's go to him right now. Heavenly Father. Would you seek his face? Come on, the prayer service is your choice.
is your chance to see truth. Lord, I pray your blessing upon your people. Take the bread. Take what we give you. We insist that you stay with us. We insist that you sit with us today. Don't leave us, oh God, come into my home. Abide with me, O God. Live in me, O God. Bring joy to me again, O God. Oh, you've drawn near to us. We didn't even know it. Lord Jesus, just like the disciples, our hearts have burned with it. Is this is Over the past few weeks, there's been a burning in some of us, Lord, when you spoke to us. Maybe we didn't respond to the burning in our heart. Lord God, today, let us respond to the cry, the call of your spirit. I'm not going to let another let service go by. Abide with me. Live with me. Open my understanding of the word. Come on, don't let it just be another sermon. Let it be the message to you from God. Be broken. are struggling to eat together for supper maybe it's not a tradition in your home is there a better time than now to start if not now if not today if not today then when habits are what hold people together and that daily connection there's all kinds of statistics that connect eating supper together with good marriages connections with family family connection it reduces drugs and alcohol abuse in young people drastically it's an amazing thing and all you're doing is sitting together at a table and eating food together you say well we haven't done it in a while well then make it a special occasion uh, this past week my wife put out the fine china and the special glasses and crystal and I didn't know I was going to be preaching this on Sunday, but it sure fits, doesn't it? We sat down and we ate together. A lot of times we eat breakfast together. We, we try to do supper together, and then we a lot of times we'll have a short devotion afterwards. We break bread, and then we break bread. It's a great opportunity to connect, to share, to talk. I'm not saying we're perfect, but, you know, we, we have to work at this, and it's worthwhile. You, you, you know what? If you've ever gone on a date, you've ever gone on a special occasion, you've ever gone to a wedding, or you've ever gone to a special event for someone's birthday party, why not do that on purpose? I know it may not be a birthday party, but maybe make some special invitations. You could do that, Brooke. You can make some special invitations. 
invite mom and dad and maybe fix supper. You're the only one here, so I'm picking on you. Maybe dad. Dad looks to cook too. Maybe you grill. I actually got to grill a couple times recently. So, yes, it's a little cold still, but I like it. Right? Make it a date, a special occasion. Make it a family or a friend celebration. You say, well, we can't meet. Well, put on Skype, put on Facebook if you've got it. Call the phone and put on speakerphone. And invite them over to eat with you. And you guys can talk. Set a time. Say we're all going to eat at 5 o'clock. So everybody gets their food together and calls one another and shares food together. Hey, you haven't had a chance to go out to eat with someone in church? Why don't you call them up? Say, I'd like to go out to eat with you. Well, we can't get together right now. Sure we can. You make food, I'll make food, and we'll sit and talk. But above all, don't let Jesus keep going. Because Jesus visits the people where love is. Insist that you break bread together. And I promise Jesus will show up if you do. We're going to conclude today. I encourage you. I already know what happens. If you want to make a new habit, it has to start today. So eat together today. Don't be sitting somewhere else. Sit at a table. Connect with one another. Love one another. It may feel a little weird, a little strange. But it won't be long before you start creating community and oneness and unity. Ask questions. Keep walking and talking. And God will be with you. I'm going to pray a prayer, then we're going to sing this uh, last hymn in conclusion. Heavenly Father, I pray for your people. On this week after Easter, as we walk and talk through our day, you've been with us all week, whether we knew it or not. Everyone that I'm that's listening right now, you were with them this past week, whether they knew it or not. You drew near to them, and you began to ask questions. Now, we may have ignored you, I don't know, but I hope not. I believe, God, we've talked with you and communed with you. But now, God, we want more than just a touch or a trickle. We want more than just a burning sensation in our spirit. God, we want, Jesus, you to show up. We want to constrain you to stay with us. Abide with me. And I will give you everything I have. And you can bless it. And you can break it and do what you want. And you can mess with it. And God, you can share it with us. And you gave it to them. You blessed it, you broke it, and you gave it to them. And Lord Jesus, you're going to give back to us. You can multiply whatever we give you. So multiply what is needed for those that have the faith. For those who are not willing to be foolish and lacking in faith. Let them trust in you. And let them eat together and sup together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's sing one last song. You're my brother, you're my sister. Take me by the hand. Together we will work till he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stay. Someone a hug. Give someone a kiss. Shake someone's hand. Love on someone. Together we will work until you come. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stay. Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Peace be with you.